Okay. This is Dr. Johansson, and I'm trying a recording on Zoom. So let's hope this works. Um, I usually use a different recording option, but it takes forever to make the video. So welcome. This is your first online lecture. Um, and what we're doing today is we're going through recombinant DNA technology. So how do we do basically gene cloning? So just so you know, this PowerPoint is posted online. The, the link to the video will be in this blank space when you get the PowerPoint. Um, so you're welcome to take, you know, print out the PowerPoint, take notes, take notes however you want, but you'll notice that there is a pre-class assignment set of questions that you should be able to answer those questions after you have watched this video. So let's just get started. Um, just to give you a little bit of history. One thing I want you to remember, um, technology is happening so quickly and moving so fast. And I want to give you a little perspective. We didn't even know the structure of DNA until 1953. Right? So now it's what almost 70 years, which sounds like a lot for you guys, but it's not a long time. Um, but things have moved really fast. And one of the developments that made recombinant DNA technology possible was in 1970 <clears throat> with the, dis the um, discovery description of restriction enzymes. And we're going to talk a lot about those today. <clears throat> and this really opened up the idea that hey, we can recombine DNA from different organisms, like from bacteria and humans and um, all kinds of organisms because DNA is DNA. And we have tools now that we can cut and paste basically DNA together. And this was revolutionary. Um, and very quickly, this little red dot here, in 1974, a recombinant DNA advisory committee was set up um, to start uh, making some regulations so that this um, gene cloning ability um, didn't get out of control. Um, we'll talk about as we go through this class where there's a lot of positive uses of recombinant DNA technology and then there could be um, issues that we will discuss um, some ethics. So another really important um, discovery was the, um, uh, uh, what do I want to say? Figuring out polymerase chain reaction, PCR. So this is a thing, something we'll talk about. Um, this is how we can amplify DNA so that we can get enough of it to work with. Um, as the years went on, some of the other high points is human genome. So now we know um, the sequence in general of the human genome, although we're all a little bit different. But we can start understanding more of the genetics and the proteins enclo encoded sorry, um, in our um, genome. And so in this class, we'll talk about some of the uses of your genetic information, such as direct-to-consumer testing. So you've probably heard of 23andMe and Ancestry.com. We will talk about pharmacogenetics, how you can use um, some of your genetic information um, to better prescribe, well, you don't prescribe, but for doctors to better prescribe drugs and treatment. Um, we will talk about CRISPR, which is a gene editing. So now we have tools that we can actually change the genetic information in cells and potentially people. Um, we will talk about, and I don't know when this really is here somewhere, gene therapy, where we can replace um, defective genes in people. And so we will read a paper on um, gene therapy. And then now with COVID, you know, there's um, all these recombinant vaccines. 
So understanding recombinant DNA technology, this basics of how we manipulate uh, DNA in the lab is going to help you understand how we make genetically modified organisms and how we make recombinant mRNA vaccines and how we do gene therapy and how we do um, CRISPR. So this may seem a little dry, um, but it's really important technology um, that's allowing us to manipulate genetic material. Okay, so this is your central dogma for molecular biology or gene expression. And so I want to remind you um, that DNA is our genetic material. And those genes can be copied through transcription into RNA. And that RNA can be translated into protein. And protein um, is really the uh, molecules that do so much. There are enzymes, there are transport proteins. Um, they're, they do so many functions in our cell, and it all comes back to the genetic material or a gene that's um, encoded on our chromosomes. So if transcription is DNA to RNA, there's also this concept of reverse transcription, or RT. So that means we're taking RNA and we're copying it and converting it back to a DNA sequence. This is what the virus HIV does. So your cells do not have reverse transcriptase, this enzyme. Okay. They have RNA polymerase, they're allowed, they can do transcription, but they can't do reverse transcription. But genes like, uh, genes, viruses like HIV can do reverse transcription, which means HIV can take its RNA genome of the virus, copy it into DNA and actually integrate the DNA um, into your genome. That's why once you are infected with HIV, you have HIV for life. It has integrated into your genome. It becomes part of the genetic material of some of your cells. So we'll talk about in biotechnology, the use of um, RT. And then up here, we're not going to talk about this till later in the semester um, when we talk about direct to consumer um, testing. Uh, but DNA replication, copying DNA, copying your chromosomes so that cells can divide in mitosis and meiosis, um, this is the basis of DNA sequencing. So all of those things you learned in general biology or maybe cell biology or genetics about DNA replication and transcription and translation, how those things work, we take advantage of all of that information and have been able to do this in the test tube. So that's kind of what this lecture is about is how we've, we've kind of applied this knowledge from cell biology to biotechnology. Okay. A few things I want you to remember. So we're gonna focus on um, eukaryotic gene expression because we're usually most interested in um, expressing like human genes, um, say somewhere else, but we also sometimes do prokaryote. But eukaryote's more complicated, so that's why I have this slide here. Um, key term, promoter. Okay, remember that a promoter is a DNA sequence. Right? And the promoter tells RNA polymerase, the enzyme that does transcription, where to start. Okay, so it's like the beginning of a gene. The promoter itself is not copied, but it's the landing spot for RNA polymerase. And there's things like enhancers and TATA boxes. There's regulatory DNA sequences that help gene expression. Sequences. 
that we'll, we'll just say that enhance, oh, I'm having a hard time spelling today. So depending on the type of cell that you're going to express your recombinant DNA in, you might have to add some um, gene enhancers, some things that help promote and say, hey, yeah, really, really express this gene. Um, Promoters and enhancers can also be tissue specific. So if you want to express a gene only in the liver and not in the muscle or the skin, you can use liver specific promoters. Another thing I want you to remember about eukaryotic genes is that we have this RNA splicing, removal of introns. So in eukaryotic genes, Introns need to be removed to make your mature mRNA, which codes for a protein. If your a cell tried to translate this um, pre-mRNA, you would have all this extra DNA information in there and you would not express the correct protein. You would have too many amino acids. So to get expression correct expression of a eukaryotic protein, we need to start with the mRNA sequence and that's where RT will come into play. Okay, so this is um, a list of the techniques um, that we're gonna talk about. Um, and these are some analysis techniques. We'll, um, sorry, I should have taken that out. We're gonna talk about DNA sequencing later in the semester. Um, but like I said, the cool thing is the DNA is DNA no matter what organism it comes from. So you can combine DNA from humans and bacteria and plants and animals and fungus and fish and anything you want. DNA is DNA, it's A-G-C-T. So, um, we have a lot of power with these recombinant DNA techniques to create new genetic information, to create even new organisms. So here are the steps we're gonna talk about. Um, and let's just do that. So the big picture, when someone says recombinant DNA or gene cloning or DNA cloning, most of the time they are literally talking about cutting with enzymes a piece of dna pasting it or the correct word is ligation or ligate that's paste we're going to put it into bacteria and grow up lots and the r dna stands for recombinant and then we're going to um, analyze it. So this is kind of interesting. Um, we use E. coli, Escherichia coli. Um, please remember when you're writing a genus species name, the genus is always capitalized and if you're abbreviating it, it gets a um, period after it and the species name is always in lowercase and then you have to either underline or write it in italics. Okay, so be really cognizant of um, that. But E. coli, something that is in our gut, well, we have a really kind of, I call it a wimpy strain of E. coli that we use in the lab. And it's just great because it's a fast growing bacteria. It um, is easy to manipulate. It's easy to put DNA in. It's just kind of the workhorse of recombinant um, DNA technology. So we'll talk about putting DNA into, back, into uh, eukaryotic cells. That's possible too, but we always go through the step of expressing it, or I shouldn't say expressing it, of um, amplifying the DNA, recombinant DNA in bacteria. So to grow up lots of it. Um, okay, so first step is you need to determine the DNA source. Well, the first step really I should say right here is you need to know the sequence 
of the gene you're interested in. And that's why sequencing the human genome and the E. coli genome and the chicken genome and the genome of all these different species is so important because without that information, we can't go in and manipulate the genetic information. Okay. So when I say you need to determine your DNA source, there's two options. Genomic, this is the chromosomes, or mRNA, this is post transcription. So why would it matter? Well, we've talked a little bit about mRNA, and you know that it has the introns removed. So this gene sequence is ready for translation. And so you might notice that I call a gene, it can be referring to DNA, it can be referring to mRNA. Um, so don't, don't think every time I say gene, it means uh, DNA. Sorry, I can't talk and write apparently. Okay, so this is super important for eukaryotic genes. Prokaryotes don't in general have uh, introns, so you don't have to worry about the splicing and, and getting everything correct. Most Prokaryotic genes are just, you can pull them from the genomic DNA and they're ready to be translated. Okay. Um, ready for translation, ready for, um, this is the expressed sequence. So gene expression, expression means making the protein. Um, the other thing that's important is, to understand is that a human cell might splice or, uh, yeah, might splice, remove the introns differently than a plant cell. So if you're going to be expressing um, a human cell in a plant cell, say you're gonna have the plant, um, make human insulin, for instance. Well, you wanna still use that mRNA sequence because the plant cell may not splice, even though it's eukaryotic, the, genetic, or the genomic information correctly. So it's always best to start with that mRNA. So then why would we ever use genomic DNA? Well, this is where you find your promoters and your regulatory sequences, like I said, enhancers. So this is how, this is how you get your gene, your favorite protein, you'll see me call it that, your favorite protein expressed in another um, artificially. You need to have the right promoter, is it, tissue specific, right? Is it only in the liver? Is it only in the muscle? Is it only in the brain? That's really important. Regulatory sequences. Can you enhance the gene expression? Okay. Or maybe there's some regulatory sequence that allows you to control when the gene is expressed. And this may seem a little overwhelming because we don't have um, actual uh, um, examples right now, but this is what we'll talk about in class. We'll work on talking about gene expression. Okay, so know your source. And here's a key, so don't forget, if you use mRNA, you will need RT, reverse transcription, okay? Because when we're using 
uh, when we're using or uh, when we're making recombinant DNA, it's really hard to work with RNA. And you probably heard about some of these COVID vaccines or SARS vaccines that are mRNA and they have to be kept at minus 80. Well, I'll tell you as a graduate student, um, I swear if you looked at a tube of mRNA wrong, it would just disintegrate it. RNA is fairly unstable compared to DNA. And so for us to be able to manipulate these gene sequences, we always work with DNA. So you would take an enzyme you can buy from your local biotech company and reverse transcribe that mRNA sequence to DNA so that you can do all this cloning that we're talking about. Okay, the next step, the way we're gonna talk about cloning is using restriction enzymes or endonuclease. I'm sorry, I don't know how to remove that, but you can see it on the real PowerPoint. So this is your cut. Okay, this is how we cut, literally. I mean, we are cutting. I shouldn't put it in quotes, I guess. Cut DNA. Very classic tool. Like I said, was discovered in the 70s. Um, one of my PhD, PhD advisors uh, earned his PhD by characterizing a restriction enzyme. And I was like, oh, you guys had it so easy when you were in grad school. You know, you would just do these things that we now buy at the store. And he wasn't too appreciative of that, but it's pretty amazing as I learned more that he characterized one of these. Um, so what is a restriction enzyme? A restriction enzyme comes from bacteria. So it's a natural um, enzyme that bacteria use to prevent um, virus infection. And like I said, we, we scientists discovered this in, these in the 70s and said, oh, we can purify them and we can use them in the lab. And these enzymes, recognize a very specific DNA sequence. And then what the enzyme does, I'm gonna write down here, is it breaks the phosphodiester bonds at a very, phospho, sorry, diester bond at a very specific site. So let's look at this. So ECOR1, this enzyme, that's its name, comes from E. coli. So you can see the ECO. And it was called restriction enzyme 1. Okay, so there's ECOR5 is another really popular one. And ECOR1, this enzyme, recognizes the sequence GAATTC, 5 prime to 3 prime. And it cuts between the, here where there's red arrows, between the G and the A and the G and A. So I want you to see these sequences are called, I uh, probably didn't spell it right, palindromic, which means they read, um, if you have a double strand the, the same way forward and backwards, so the five prime, five prime. So hopefully you remember five prime, three prime of um, DNA. And it cuts and it breaks this phosphodiester bond here and here. And that leaves what we call sticky or staggered ends. And what's really cool about this, and I'll show you in a minute, is if you have two DNAs, so you still have your base pairs here. If you have two DNAs with these sticky ends, they're gonna to wanna to come together and reform all these base pairs. And that's how we do molecular cloning. So this is just to show you that you can have different types of overhangs, not really super important for us.
um, PST1 comes from this different bacteria. Small one comes from serratia, and it makes what we call a blunt cut. So it cuts right down the middle of the sequence it recognizes. And blunt ends are much harder to clone with because they don't have this overhang that makes the DNA want to do base pairing. Um, so you have to kind of jam these ends together. So for the most part, we use sticky or um, staggered ends. Um, OK, so here is just showing you that I think this is kind of a cool picture. Um, this is ECOR1. And so in orange is the double strand of DNA. And the enzymes actually work together. So there's two restriction enzymes or restriction endonucleases. So one in light green, one in kind of turquoise. And they cut, you can see they're making this staggered end. So you're gonna have this base pairing part available. And this is just showing you kind of in a nice linear model. Um, and what do I wanna say? Just kind of that's, that's the mechanism. It's breaking this phosphodiester bond right here and right here and pr producing these um, sticky ends for cloning. Okay, um, so when we say we do a restriction digest, that is the process of mixing DNA plus the enzyme, the restriction enzyme, or the endonuclease. And just so you know, endonuclease tells you a lot. Endo means it cuts inside the sequence, not at the end. Nuclease means it cuts nucleic acid, so DNA or RNA. So what this is trying to show you is you do a restriction digest, and here's the gene of interest, and here's something called a plasmid. We're gonna talk about what a plasmid is in a minute, but just what I want you to see is it's a circular piece of DNA. for gene cloning. So this is something you can buy from a biotech company, create your own, and we'll talk about some of the other characteristics of a plasmid. So when you do a restriction digest, um, you usually mix the DNA and the enzyme, and you put it at 37 degrees, which is body temperature, so 37 degrees Celsius. You don't have to know these details, for 30 to 60 minutes. And the enzyme comes in and it finds in this case, um, ECOR1, all the GAATTC sequences, and it cuts them. And it makes these sticky ends so that what you do after the restriction digest is you mix your, I should say, cut gene of interest plus the cut plasmid, and you do these in different test tubes usually and you combine them through an enzyme called ligase. So you join two DNA molecules. And that is recombinant DNA. You're recombining DNA from different sources and you're making it in to a single double helix. So ligase is our join or our paste step. And we'll talk about this more in a second. Okay. The key here is that they both have complementary sticky ends. So you gotta, oops. Um, you cut with the same enzyme. So you gotta cut the plasmid and the gene of interest with that same enzyme, right, to make those same sticky ends. 
so that now you can stick this gene in here. Okay, let's talk about what these cloning vectors or plasmids are. So, first thing to know is that there are small circular DNA. Okay. Um, so remember that your chromosomes are these long linear, like millions of base pairs. These are usually thousands of base pairs. Generally four to five thousand, not really big. And <clears throat> these are were originally found again in bacteria. They were extra chromosomal, so not part of the chromosome. Um, DNA that um, are used in bacteria to give them different um, properties. So different antibiotic resistance can be transferred between bacteria um, through plasmids. One of the issues we have with um, antibiotic resistance. Um, but again, we've taken advantage of things that naturally happen in, uh, in nature <laughs> that are naturally going on in cells and we use them in biotechnology. So a couple things that are really super important for a plasmid or a cloning vector. First of all, it has to have an ORI, which is the origin of replication. So this is for DNA replication. And this means the plasmid can self replicate. So it still needs all the proteins for DNA replication. But it has a signal that says, hey, replicate me, replicate me, replicate me. And this is how we can make lots of recombinant DNA in E. coli. The other thing you want your cloning vector or plasmid to have is restriction sites, which just means the DNA sequence that a restriction enzyme recognizes. So you can see all of these three to four letter codes with, with numbers. All those are Roman numerals out at the end. All of these different restriction sites that we have um, for cloning. The other thing you see in pink and red are antibiotic resistance genes. And this is important for selection of recombinant DNA. Okay, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, but basically this plasmid has ampicillin resistance and tetracycline resistance. That means if a cell has this circular piece of DNA in it and you put ampicillin or tetracycline into its growth media, it will be resistant and it can grow. And all the cells that don't have this plasmid with it will die. So this is a way to select um, for your recombinant DNA in cells. And we'll talk about that in a minute. For most of um, our use, we're going to want to express a protein. So you also need a promoter. So this is the fourth really important component because without a promoter, your recombinant DNA will just sit there. There'll be nothing to tell the cell, hey, this is an important gene, express it. Transcribe it into RNA, get it translated. And this should say antibiotic resistance. So one, oh, we should say there's restriction site, restriction site. So that's the second thing you gotta have. You've gotta have some kind of selection and you've gotta have a way to turn on. So you're gonna see 
vectors, plasmids um, used interchangeably. Um, they're called vectors. So plasmid is the name that came from bacteria, small circular DNA. Vector is usually what we talk about, a plasma that we clone into and move between um, cells. This is just a couple more examples of expression vectors. Again, these are ones you can buy um, from different biotech companies. Um, MCS, which is shown here and just here in general, stands for multiple cloning site. So you can see what we have here is we have a promoter and the multiple cloning site. And it would be something like this. It would have, it's got SAC1 and SAC2 and NOT1 and EXPO1 and SMA and HINDI3 and SAL1, XHO1, KPN1, all these sites that you can choose to cut the DNA, open it up, and put your gene in there. So multiple cloning sites usually come right before the promoter. Um, I want you to see, this one must have some kind of promoter here. They both have origins of replication. Um, this one has an origin for both eukaryotic and prokaryotic cells, more information than you need. They both have um, antibiotic resistance so that they can select. And then some of these different uh, vectors have different features. So we will talk about um, vectors in class and um, you will practice cloning, practice on paper, cloning things in. Okay, so restriction sites are really awesome. Restriction enzymes are great, but there is a challenge. And the challenge is you don't want to cut your gene in the middle. Okay, so this is just um, gene sequence I found and it has some restrictions. So there's FAM and HINDI3 and KPN1 and NSI1 and SPLA1, BSP, ECOR1. Well, that's great, but you don't want to use a HINDI3 restriction enzyme and cut in the middle of your gene because you can see this is the protein coding. These are the amino acids and that's going to mess things up. So sometimes there's not a restriction site nicely at the beginning and one at the end of your gene that you can cut and paste it into a vector. So we're gonna talk about some of the ways to um, deal with that. Sorry, my daughter is God, texting me even though I said I was recording a lecture. All right. Um, okay, so the other question is, how do we get enough DNA to even work with? So I want to introduce you to the idea of polymerase chain reaction, PCR. Um, you may or may not have heard of this, but the whole purpose is to make lots of DNA to work with, oh, which is what it says right up there. <laughs> so polymerase chain reaction is, as it, the name says, is a chain reaction and it's polymerizing, amplifying the DNA. And this is not what we use for amplifying big regions of DNA, like a whole plasmid. This is for amplifying your gene or a small region to check to see if you have the right sequence in there, um, things like that. So this was developed, like I said, in about in the early 1980s. Um, Carrie Mullis, 
it's basically in vitro DNA replication. Um, the chain reaction, you're going to see that we have three temperatures. Um, I'm kind of looking at my notes here. Because um, my note on my slide says we will talk about this on a, more on another slide. Um, but let's just, oh, I'm, I'm just going to go through some of this. Okay, so this is what we call your template DNA. So this could be a really long, super long strand. This could be chromosomes. This could be uh, mRNA if we take a step back. And you have something called a DNA primer. The DNA primer is a sequence that you generate and tells DNA polymerase, which is our, hopefully you remember, replication enzyme. It tells DNA polymerase where to start and stop, basically. So if you think back to DNA replication, hopefully you remember, you have to unwind the double helix, you have to split it apart, and DNA polymerase comes in and copies the strands, you have a leading and lagging strand, and you make two new chromosomes. Well, we're not copying that big of a DNA region. So <coughs> we put a primer on that says here's the end, of the gene and here's the start of the gene. And remember, hopefully you remember that DNA replication, DNA polymerase requires a three prime hydroxyl group. Let's just write this differently. DNA polymerase requires a three prime OH. So hopefully you remember in your DNA replication that there are RNA primers made that get things started. What we do is we make artificial DNA primers and seriously you can basically go to a biotech company, a company that produces these products, you type in a gene sequence five prime to three prime, you send it off, week later they send you a vial with this DNA that has all these little pieces of DNA with that exact sequence. Really super cool. What does that mean? Like I said, I hopefully said earlier on, you have to know the sequence of your gene because you have to, to be able to design primers that says this is the start and this is the stop of the gene. And what's happening in um, PCR <clears throat> is that you denature, so you unwind the helix with heat. So in regular cells, you have an enzyme called helicase. But here, helicase, our helicase would denature, look at this temperature, 94 to 96 degrees Celsius. This is way, way, way hotter than your body. All of your enzymes would denature. So we have to use special enzymes in this polymerase chain reaction. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But basically what we do is we heat up the DNA and all the hydrogen bonds that hold those two strands together are broken. Annealing is where our primers come in, and this is annealing. And so we cool it down so that the primers can base pair with your target DNA. And then they say, hey, DNA polymerase, let's copy. And that's the elongation step, in vitro DNA replication. So here the DNA polymerase comes in and copies, 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 copies. Great one round. 
now we stop, we repeat, we break those double helixes, put in, you have more primers, and they copy, 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 until eventually you have millions of copies of this one DNA sequence. I have um, put in the resources for recombinant DNA technology, a really good video for PCR. I know it's, it's kind of hard to visualize here, so I really encourage you to watch that. Um, so I said this is happening at really high temperatures. So 37 degrees Celsius is body temperature, is your 98 degrees Fahrenheit. So you can see that these are all happening at much higher temperatures where your, your proteins would naturally denature. So we had to find um, different proteins. And this is a picture of me and my youngest daughter, Jessica, who is now 17, but still has that iPad. Um, <laughs> at Yellowstone, um, this is the cistern spring. And I totally geeked out because this is where the bacteria, Thermus aquaticus, was discovered. And Thermus aquaticus, you may have heard of it called TAC. So this is the DNA replication enzyme or the DNA polymerase used in PCR. And I was just like, oh, like I said, totally geeking out. Because this bacteria lives in this incredible hot spring. And so its enzymes don't denature at high temperatures like ours would. Um, and so we've isolated the enzyme from Thermus aquaticus. And we can now use heat, high temperature, to denature. We don't have to have helicase. And then Thermus aquaticus is our DNA polymerase. And because these are such short um, fragments, we don't have to actually work it, worry about Okazaki fragments. We just go from five prime to three prime and five prime to three prime. That's interesting. That's a kind of a bad labeling on that. All right. Um, so here's, let's see what I want to say here. Um, another example trying to show you what polymerase chain reaction does. And it's repeating these cycles, usually about 30 times, of increasing the temperature to denature, decreasing the temperature to let your primers anneal, putting tack at its happy temperature of about 72 for copying, and then repeating it. Denature, anneal, copy. Denature, anneal, copy, or elongate. Um, so let's just write that really quick. So the first step is denature. So this is break DNA hydrogen bonds. Anneal. Let the primers bind and elongate which is copy the DNA. And then you repeat. So that's why it's a chain reaction. So polymerase, copying, making more, chain reaction over and over and over. Um, and so then you get thousands and millions of copies of this DNA, and then we have plenty of DNA to work with. Okay. Um, and oh. Remember that the primers um, allow well, for only a specific DNA sequence to be copied. Okay. Um, so reverse transcriptase PCR or reverse transcription PCR, RT-PCR. This is when you start with mRNA. So if you're cloning a eukaryotic gene, 
you want to start with the mRNA because the introns are removed. And so you isolate RNA from a cell and you use reverse transcription. And one of the easiest ways is the primer is called an oligo DT, which just means a string of T nucleotides. Right? So here it is, T, 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 T. This makes, I don't know what the B is for, the three prime end and away the reverse transcriptase enzyme. So RT is an enzyme. isolated from retroviruses like HIV. And reverse transcription copies and makes what we call cDNA. So cDNA is single-stranded. Some call it copy DNA, so it's a copy of the RNA. Some call it complementary DNA. But now we have our gene as a DNA sequence. So we've taken our mRNA and we've copied it by reverse transcription to DNA. And now we can go through all of our steps of gene cloning. We can copy the cDNA into double-stranded DNA by PCR. So the cDNA goes into the PCR reaction. And we can make a whole bunch of um, that gene sequence. OK, so if you start with mRNA, you just need one extra step. You need a poly-T or an oligo-DT tail um, primer, sorry and you do your RT reaction and then you throw it into the PCR reaction. Okay, now I mentioned back here that sometimes you don't have the right restriction enzymes. Well, that's cool because, I mean, that's fine, because with PCR, you can add on your own sequences. Adding sequences with, with PCR via the primers. So now I say, okay, let's go back here. I want to start my gene with this, I don't know where the methionine is, but G, G, A, T, C, C, G, C, A sequence, right? But I need a restriction site. Oh, well, I have ECOR1 here. So maybe I add an ECOR1 to that primer. So that's G A A T C T C. So I literally can, when I type in the sequence for making a primer, I can just add some DNA. And what happens is that, oops, sorry. Um, you add these sequences, so the yellow is the primer. And it looks like it's kind of flapping in the wind, but you copy it, you copy it, and pretty soon that new sequence becomes part of your PCR, what we call PCR product, the result of PCR. Now you can cut with ECOR1 because you've just created that site. So it's really cool that you can engineer your own restriction sites. on to primers for PCR. So if you look back here, you would look at what your um, plasmid had in the multiple cloning site. And you would say, well, I, I don't want to use Hindi 3, and I don't want to use NSI 1, or KPN 1, or BSP 1, or SPL 1. Um, but what could I use that works for both my plasmid and for my gene of interest. That's why a multiple cloning site is so important. It gives you lots of choices 
so that you don't cut your gene in the middle. And then you just engineer, you just add that sequence on to your primer and it creates that sequence in your PCR product and you cut and you do your paste. Um, there are other cloning methods um, that don't involve restriction enzymes, but because this is not a molecular biology and cloning class, we are not going to go into those. Okay, so restriction digest, um, maybe we did PCR first, then the restriction digest, ligation, we've kind of talked about. This is the act of pasting or joining two DNA sequences. This uses the enzyme ligase, which if you remember, jump, 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 jump. oops, here is DNA ligase. It's a naturally occurring enzyme that is used to connect all the Okazaki fragments on the ligase strand. So we've isolated that enzyme. We can put it in the test tube. We get recombinant DNA. So great. We've glued our pieces together. We have this little thing in the test tube. Now we need to do something with it. We need to grow up more of this plasmid and we really can't use PCR to do that. So the next thing we're gonna do is uh, what we call transformation or transfection. And that means we get our recombinant DNA into cells to either grow up, or I should say, you guys, that might not make sense, to produce more DNA, or to and or express protein of interest, the gene you cloned. Okay, both is the same concept. Transformation is when you're going into bacteria. Transfection is when you're going into eukaryotic cells. Same general idea. The goal is to get your DNA that you've just made into a cell so that you can grow up more cells and um, make lots of DNA. So what this is trying to show you for transformation, and if you took micro, you may have done this. We can use something called a heat shock. So these are the methods of transformation. Or we can use electroporation. It's amazing, I cannot ever spell. Okay. So heat shock is where you mix in your test tube your new recombinant DNA and your bacteria and you keep it on ice and then you transfer it really quickly to some warmer water and then back to ice. And for some reason, this makes kind of like pores in um, the bacterial cell and you get, oops, the DNA in there. Electroporation requires a special piece of equipment, but it's the same idea. Instead of heat shocking, you actually zap the E. coli and the recombinant plasmid with a little bit of electricity and that forces the DNA in. For eukaryotic cells, we have some different methods. Um, here's electroporation, that's what I used to use. Lipofection, which is you surround your DNA with um, basically a membrane. And this is kind of cool now because this is how the mRNA vaccines are getting into our cells with um, a liposome or lipids. Um, Microinjection, you can actually directly inject DNA into a cell nucleus if it's a big enough cell, or we can sometimes use a virus to transfect or move that DNA in. 
this is going to be really important when we talk about um, gene therapy. A lot of it's with viral transfections. Some of it's with lip affection. Um, viruses are a little more specific than the lip affection. But for instance, for our, the um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, we just want those um, that vaccine, that mRNA, to get into a cell and express the spike protein so we can build antibodies against it. Okay, I know I'm talking a lot. Um, this is my problem when I record videos. So um, selection is the next step, and this is where your or you want to only have cells growing. So the cells you transfected that have the recombinant DNA. So you can imagine that when you're doing electroporation or heat shock, some cells get the plasmid, some don't. And this is where your antibiotic resistance comes in. So you'll have your nutrients for the, the um, cells plus this antibiotic. And so non-transformed cells are going to die because they don't have the recombinant. And the transformed cells with that, say, ampicillin resistance gene are going to live. And then you get something called colonies. So you can do this in both prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. There are different um, types of what we call antibiotics for um, eukaryotic cells. But these colonies that you see growing hopefully have your recombinant DNA. You always have to double check. Um, but this is what you might see. So this is bacteria. So these are individual colonies that are resistant to whatever antibiotics on this plate. Yeast is a eukaryotic cell. These are yeast colonies. So yeast are used a lot um, in studying eukaryotic genes. And this is mammalian cells, or what we also call as tissue culture. Um, and G418 is the resistance gene. And what happens is you eventually see these little clumps of cells growing that are um, resistant. So here, untransfected cells, these cells, they basically all die because they don't have the resistance gene. There's another cool method for bacteria that's called blue-white screening. And for that, you have to have a special plasmid. So your plasmid has to encode a gene called beta gal or beta galactosidase. In addition to antibiotic resistance, you've got to have both. But what's cool about this is what you do is you clone your foreign DNA into this beta gal gene, and it interrupts it and makes it non-functional. So if you have, you have these three potential cells after um, transformation. So you might get the plasmid into the cell, but there's no foreign DNA. Um, it has the resistance, right? So it grows and the colonies are blue. So beta gal, when expressed, makes blue bacterial colonies. If you actually get your recombinant DNA in here and it interrupts the gene, foreign DNA is exerted, inserted, <laughs> you get white colonies. And if the cell didn't take up the foreign DNA, the recombinant DNA at all, it's all dead, right? Dead. No colonies. Because it doesn't have the resistance gene. So what does that really look like? It looks like something like this. So you can see you've got blue and white colonies. And you're going to pick some of these white colonies should have your recombinant DNA. You always, always, always have to check, even if it's a resistant colony, 
sometimes what happens where we got some sometimes what happens is uh, this plasma just goes back together and so you'll have that resistance gene but you'll have no foreign insert it's got sticky ends there's there's ways we can prevent this but we're not going to get into that i get i get way too excited about molecular biology um, so you always need to screen or um, check. And that's what we're going to talk about next is some of the methods for analyzing your DNA. So white colony should have our DNA always check. And one of the key ways to check is doing a restriction digest. Right? So if you had your plasmid, let's just say with eco R1, and then you have your plasmid with your recombinant DNA, it still has that eco R1 site. So you can do a restriction digest. So this is going to be um, a uh, Um, resistant colony, this is going to be a resistant colony. So you can always do your restriction digest and see did it cut once or did it cut twice? And that's what we're going to talk about looking at next. So I think that's where I am. Yes. Um, okay, so we've talked about our steps. Recombinant DNA, you determine what source of DNA you're going to use. You do a restriction digest with both your DNA and the plasmid, and you do a ligation, right? But many times you have to do an amplification step to get your DNA. Once we do the ligation, we transform or transfect that recombinant DNA into cells. Then we select the cells with the recombinant DNA by antibiotics. And now we're going to talk about analyzing what we've made. And please remember, you can pause this video at any time. My daughter keeps texting me. You're still talking? OK. Gel electrophoresis. Okay. This is a method that allows you to visualize DNA or RNA or protein molecules. Not individual molecules, but masses of molecules. And the whole point, well, let's just, let me do this. You can have horizontal. So if you ran any gels in um, your labs, you probably did horizontal, or you have the gel rig, and you have your gel here, and you put your sample. And the electrophoresis part is that we use electricity to separate molecules based on size. So we have horizontal, which is the most common, especially for DNA or RNA. We also have vertical, which is used for DNA sequencing in the old days, um, used for proteins, used for some um, RNA. <coughs> Excuse me. The concept is the same. They're both using electrical field. <coughs> Excuse me. They're both separating molecules based on size <coughs> ah, by using um, electricity. So how does that work? 
well, DNA, RNA, and proteins kind of. <coughs> DNA and RNA have a negative charge. That sugar phosphate backbone is negative. So what we do is we put them in one part of our gel and they will move towards the positive. So by using that electricity, they're moving and they're separating by size. So the smallest fragments move the farthest. <coughs> sorry, sorry. And the heaviest or the largest move the slowest. Um, and what we're talking about is away from kind of where you start, where you put your sample in. So think about this. These gels are kind of the consistency of really firm jello. Okay. So if you have, if you made a room full of jello and put us all at one wall and said go, well, <laughs> the little people are probably going to be able to move fast and get through that gel matrix faster and move farther towards the, the wall on the far end than us bigger people. And that's exactly what's happening with um, the DNA or the RNA or the proteins that you are um, separating. They're going to separate based on size. And this is an image of an actual gel. So you can see these little lines. These are called bands. And each band is a specific size and it contains thousands and thousands of molecules. And the thicker the band means there's more molecules of the same size. And a thinner band just means less molecules. So I think if we all got trapped, right? There was a whole bunch of us, we'd make a big thick mass. And if there was a few of us, we'd make a little skinnier mass. mass. So heaviest moves slower than lightest or, or smallest. And then the thickness of the band tells you how much. So for instance, if we look over here, this has more DNA than that one. And the fainter you get, the less DNA or RNA you have. Um, <clears throat> here's another image. Um, so this is again um, some DNA that was cut with restriction enzymes. These thicker bands mean there's, means there's more DNA than these thinner bands. But the difference is based on size. Large to small. And the reason I include this um, image is hopefully you can kind of see that there's a hollow space in this second part. <clears throat> What's really cool is you can literally, literally take a razor blade and cut out this DNA from a gel and purify it. And now you have this pure DNA of this size that says 1,580 base pairs. And you can go and use that for your cloning. So most of the time when we do PCR, we actually purify it before we cut and then do the ligation. It just kind of cleans up some extra stuff. Um, so this is just showing you that you can actually isolate DNA from these gels. Um, and the band shape is due to the way we load these gels, the wells. So you can see these wells are all these little rectangles and look at the bands are all these little rectangles. So don't think that rectangle shape means anything. It's just based on, um, where we started the samples, how the, the wells or the holder for that sample was created. Okay, so here are some gels. And I want you to see this person's holding this gel here. 
and it is really flimsy and it's like jello and it's see-through you can't see the dna until you stain the dna and um, the worst thing to do is pick up this gel and take it over to the imaging system and then drop it into a thousand pieces i've done it trust me um, the colors here are what we call tracking dyes so it's just showing you how far the samples this one actually has two sets of wells and you can kind of see this is where the sample goes and so we can kind of tell how far the samples have moved because we know this size and this size but to visualize it you have to stain the dna and <clears throat> the most common types of staining are well in the old days we used ethidium bromide which is a carcinogen so people don't use it very much anymore um, now they use this um, green stain which is less toxic it's supposed to be more sensitive but so you would would um, have some of this um, stain in your sample and you would take it over to a uv light and take an image of it so what you're doing in the lab you can't see anything you have no idea where the dna is if it's there or not oops until you visualize it and so these black and white ones are just um, the computer has taken a, a image of the gel and turned it into black and white instead of printing color um what else do i want to say oh these things that you always see on like the ends these are called size standards <clears throat> or size markers and so here if you look back at this gel that had some information this was the size standard so this is a standard piece of dna you buy from the store and it runs at a very specific size and that's how they knew that this piece of DNA was 3,400 base pairs, and this one was 1,580, and this one was 630 based on, on these bands. And it, it may look like a mess, but the more you do it, the more you, you kind of get to know these size markers. So <clears throat> molecular weight markers um, are used, and again, they, these are just known standards so that you can guesstimate the size of your sample um, and they're in base pairs and if you see kbp that means kilo not with two l's come on so a thousand <clears throat> base pairs is one kb or KBP. Um, let's see what else. Okay. A couple other terms I want you to understand. I'm almost done, I promise. Um, we've talked about PCR. We've talked about RT PCR, which is RNA to DNA. QPCR stands for quantitative. It used to be called real time. But I don't think it is anymore. Um, right here, real time. So people got confused and they said RT PCR real time. No, no. RT is reverse transcription. Q is real time. So you can have Q PCR, which means we're quantitating it, or you can have Q RT PCR, which means we started with RNA, but we're still quantitating the PCR. And this can be very, very <clears throat> um, accurate, I guess is the word I want. So you get, you can tell how much of a sample you have. Really important when people are looking at, say, um, viruses. Uh, uh, how much infection do you have? You could do Q RT PCR for the SARS CoV 2 virus. So, <clears throat> um, SARS CoV 2 is an RNA virus. So you have to do RT PCR 
and then you can amplify and you can get actual good data telling how much um, virus was in a specific um, sample. So PCR and RT-PCR are good for just looking, hey, do we have it? It's kind of a yes, no thing. If you wanna go quantitative, you have to do this Q um, PCR. And the reason it's quantitative is because what happens <clears throat> during a PCR reaction is you're amplifying, you're amplifying, you're amplifying, and all of a sudden you hit log phase, right? Where it's two to four to eight to blah, 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 blah. And it just keeps going up. And then you hit a plateau phase where you're starting to run out of nucleotides or the enzymes kind of dying out, or you might be running out of primers things like that. And so when you run a gel, you really don't know how much sample there was. And you can see this says 10-fold serial dilutions. So if this was 1x and 10x and 100x and 1,000x, you can't really tell the difference. So QPCR helps eliminate that. And what it's doing is it's monitoring the products at every cycle. So it's, it's taking a snapshot. How much DNA do we have after one round of amplification? Amplification. How much after four, seven, 10, 13? And you get these curves and um, there's nice programs that, that tell you back um, and you use a standard that says, okay, this means you had this much um, DNA in this sample and this much DNA in that sample. Um, and so it's very, like I said, quantitative, very accurate. Um, doing it with just regular PCR, you can tell it's very hard to see the differences, right? So PCR is no longer considered quantitative, not even RT-PCR. Even if you took samples out and ran them on your gel at every time, it's just not accurate. Okay. So again, why use QPCR? really important for determining um, virus load, levels of gene expression. So if you're looking at different samples um, of tissue, say, or different um, samples when a mouse is under stress and not stress, and you're looking, is this gene upregulated? You would use the qPCR or qRT-PCR to determine these differences in gene expression. Um, that's also used in GMOs to figure out how many times a, um, a recombinant DNA might have been integrated into a GMO. We'll talk about that later. Um, they use it a lot in food safety to determine how much microbial contamination um, there might be. So real-time PCR, Q PCR is quantitative. Regular PCR and RT-PCR are more kind of like look-see, yes, we have it, no, we don't, hey, we got enough to do some more experiments with. Okay, I'm feeling the same way. Um, <laughs> so what do you need to know? Hopefully you've taken some notes. What I want you to do next is go to the pre-class um, recombinant DNA questions, write your answers in complete sentences, show your understanding, this is due Monday, uh, January 25th at basically midnight in the week two module. And then what we will do on Wednesday in class is we will get together and we will um, work some recombinant DNA problems together. You will have a chance to ask questions about this material. I will give you feedback on your answers as a group and then you will do some post-class questions to show me you really understand about recombinant DNA. And again, like I said, um, this is a lot of stuff. It's hard without a lab.
but it's really important to kind of give you the background to understand how we do CRISPR and genetically modified organisms and gene therapy and making these recombinant vaccines, all the stuff that we'll talk about um, this semester. Okay, sorry for the long video. Um, I look forward to seeing you all Wednesday the 27th.